you're going to set it down there for a few weeks, maybe a month, and then after that, it may go into the youth trailer and passed out. So, but so there is some of those down there. Um, we are glad everybody is here today. You know, people are always wondering, you know, when are we going to get back to normal? I don't know. I don't know what normal is anymore. I don't think anybody knows. So we are just doing the uh, the best that we can at certain times and trusting God to uh, show us where to go. Um, I know this week they had a school board meeting. School's all set to go. You know, all, everything is different. I mean, from work to school. So we just need to keep praying that, you know, things level out. And they have been here pretty good, so I'm, we're very thankful for that. But, I mean, it makes it a lot more difficult now. As far as, how's teaching? Is it different? Yeah. Was it different last year? Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah. 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 That's like children's story. I'd rather have the kids up here. But. So, at this time, we are going to start our worship service. And, you know, you can stop... Um, the younger kids, we went out today for a, a nature walk, made one mistake. I wore my jacket. It's warm out there today. So, but, you know, you get outside, you can do stuff. I think of all those people, you know, in the bigger cities where they cannot get out. And I'm thinking, man, this has to be extremely tough. Um, when I was talking with Pastor last night, you know, his churches, they're still not open down there. That would be, so I'm happy for what we have. So.
Let's bow our heads. Our most gracious and loving Father, Father, we come to you and we thank you for another Sabbath day, the day that you have blessed, that you have, the day you have given us for rest, to reflect on your goodness, your greatness, and Father, just to contemplate your love. We ask that you'd be with us as we enter into the service, that you'd be with pastor as he's on his way here. Father, that your angels would attend us and cast out the evil influences that would try to discourage or distract us. Father, in all things, help us to honor you. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Um, it's time for our tithes and offerings. And the reading... Bring it up. Okay. They're here. <laughs> um, the offering appeal for today is our mission is a church... Is to, the mission of our church is to reach the North American Division Territory with a distinctive christ Center Seventh-day Adventist message of hope and wholeness. Stewardship Ministries is dedicated to helping members catch this vision. Systematic giving is part of being a faithful steward. When we return tithe, we are recognizing that God owns everything. Giving offerings expresses our gratitude for what God has done for us. God loves a cheerful giver, and he has chosen this message to support those who preach the gospel as they reach the world with his message. You will find an extensive selection of videos emphasizing various offerings by visiting our website. You can use these in conjunction with the offering appeals. Faithful stewardship is a matter of heart. We don't give to receive love and blessings from God. We give because we have already received God's love. We give because we want to live out God's character of abundantly life, abundant life generosity, especially as exhibited through the giving of the ultimate gift of Christ His Son. The deacons would come forward at this time. Let's bow our heads. Our gracious Father, we thank you for this time we can give. Father, help us as we return to give because we want to give. And Father, the offering today is for the Michigan um, Assistance Program. And we ask that you would bless this as it has been a blessing to our church, that we can be a blessing to our fellow churches. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. I'm not sure. Pastor has this prayer. Is he here? Is he not here yet? Okay. So we'll pass the children's story and we'll come back to that. Um, so we will go into the call to prayer now. And so if you'll join me as we um, bow in prayer in this song, if you would just want to, to yourselves, the call to prayer song is at the bottom of the bulletin there. But let's bow before our Father in prayer.
Our Father, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer. Father, there are many requests among us. Father, there are people that we know that are in very dire situations. I'm thinking of John, um, Jane Lynn Thomas's son, and he's out west in a coma because of burns to most of his body. And Father, we just thank you that he's still alive and that he is slowly showing some signs of recovery. Father, there are those among us that have lost loved ones recently. Think of the Danfords. Father, you know the pain and the suffering, um, that unexpected situation. Father, there are other requests that are just as um, bearing upon us. Father, whether it's family or friends or just personal. And so, Father, in your great love, by sending your son Jesus, we lift up these requests to you. And knowing as our great high priest, he ministers for each one of us. Father, we do not know the depths of your love, but we can experience that as we look to him and leave these situations with him, knowing that you will do what is best. So, Father, we just lift these requests to you. And, Father, again, we ask that you be with pastor as he's on his way here, that you give him safety and be with those who are not among us, Father Gunther and his family who are visiting and others who are traveling. We ask for your protection for them. And Father, with our government, you see the situation um, across this nation. You have blessed this nation, Father, and you continue to bless it. But the adversary is trying in every way he can to take away our freedoms. And so, Father, we thank you that we can assemble here to together. And we ask that you would bless our leaders and that right would be done and that the Holy Spirit and the angels would speak to the hearts of those making decisions. And Father, be with those that are ill, that you would draw close to them and that you would strengthen them and that you would bring an end to this plague, this situation. Father, that your will be done and righteousness would reign and that we would see your hand. Father, not on the great scale, which it is, but especially in the personal. So, Father, we lift these requests to you, and we just thank you for Jesus and for his sacrifice and for that day that he's coming soon to return us to your kingdom where you would have us to be. Father, we thank you for your great love, and we thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Somebody who's going to do our scripture reading? Okay. Come on up. Please turn into your new Bibles to Luke 8, 8, and 15. And some fell into good soil and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears, let him hear. As for that in the good soil, there are those who hear the word, hold fast in it, in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. Our sound of praise this morning is going to be brought to us by Gianna rolled in. And so come on up.
That was wonderful. Um, last was it last Friday, we got a call, Sandy at their station. Um, we all along through the week we had been hearing that Cam and Jody had Cam and Jody Ferguson. For Joe, Cam works for us at Strong Tower Radio as one of our development directors. So they had a well pump and they have a tank in the ground. And the tank had apparently failed, it had lost pressure. And so the tank was um, basically not working very well. They had very little pressure in the house. In fact, the pump, the well pump was continuously running just to get. Um, water for the bathroom, the kitchen, whatever. And showers were almost impossible. Uh, maybe they were possible, but it was really rough. So anyways, um, you know, sometimes the Lord works on your heart. And so Bethany helped me out. And her brothers, Fred and Keith, they went up there. And John Duman went up there later in last Friday afternoon. Um, Cam didn't know where his tank was. Um, they assumed it was by the well, and so, you know, you dig a circle a perimeter around there, and you don't see anything, you don't find anything. So they looked and looked, and they couldn't find it. They thought, well, maybe it's over here by the house. And so they started probing and digging over there. They couldn't find it. So um, Cam had done some of that, and so then they thought, let's dig a bigger perimeter around the well to see if we can find it there. And they found it, and it was probably about from the top of the ground down the base of the well, the pump, it was about five feet down. And so, you know, some would say that's not deep enough, um, but it's been there for 20 years. And so Fred and Keith, they dug it out. And then John Duman went out a little bit after Fred and Keith left. And John dug a deeper hole so somebody could work in there and um, just through the course of events, we worked with Roger Thomas from Lake City Church. He gave the, well, he got the tank. Some gracious people paid for the tank because Cam and Jody are a little bit stretched right now, um, trying to sell their house and things. And so Roger got it to Bethany, and then I took Bethany's van over to Cam and Jody's house, and... Um, Carl Johnson's brother, Raymond, helped put the tank in. What I'm going to is yesterday, Andy, can you give us just a little bit of what you guys did there yesterday? Youth of His Message went up there, and they um, did a work experience up there at, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but there you go. So, yeah, we... Um the Youth of His Message group got contacted by Sandy last week, and so the kids, uh, we I reached the kids, and um, I think we had 11 kids, something like that, that went up there, and the tank had been fixed, but it still needed to be, uh, all the dirt needed to be filled back in, and it needed to be insulated, so <clears throat> that was worked on. And then they also had, uh, they have, they raised goats, and they were having more goats, and we actually, two goats were born while we were there, actually. So the kids got to see that. Um, but they needed their fencing fixed because they didn't have enough space for all their goats. And so the kids uh, did what probably would have taken the two of them several weekends. And, you know, we put the, you know, put more fencing up for them in order to be able to, you know, increase the enclosure for their goats. And... Uh, and then also help put their electric fence back up so that the, uh, you know, so that predators won't get in there to get these cute little, like, six-inch tall baby goats that they had running around there. Um, but, you know, this is just another, you know, this is this group of young people, every time we go out on a project, they just, they're super impressive with how hard they actually work. And, um, you know, and the kids are really willing to do this. They really want to help people. And, uh, and for Cam and Jody, I, you could tell, like, I, when, I, when we were done, it didn't feel like we'd done that much. I mean, really, we were, we were up there for three or four hours, and, um, you know, the kids have fun working with each other. But uh, you could tell they were like, man, this is such a blessing because this would have taken us 
we didn't even know like they have so many other things going on at their house like we don't know when we would have even gotten to this project so thank you for supporting this group of young people and uh you know i think that was really an answered prayer for cam and jody And, you know, that's the spirit that the Lord wants us to have, that we can see a need and we can step up to the plate and help people because the old saying, many hands make work light, you know, make the work a lot lighter. And so one person, Cam, who is having some, um, some issues with his health right now, nothing se severe, but yet he needs to back away from physical labor some. And yet he was out there with Fred and Keith digging the ditch around and Jody was saying he's burned himself out. And so the point of it is, is just that we, when you see something that we can do, let us know, let the church know, because there are people in our midst that are silently suffering and yet we could be a blessing to them if we just knew that there's an opportunity to be a witness or to share with others. And, you know, one of the things I've been studying, I've been going through the Bible um, chapter by chapter every week, and reading this week was just Matthew chapter 24. And Jesus is talking in there about the signs of his coming. And the interesting thing, as I read through the scriptures, is Jesus told his disciples time and time again, okay, fellas, this is what's going to happen. They're going to arrest me. These things are going to happen. They're going to put me through trial. These things are going to happen. They're going to crucify me. These things are going to happen. Then I'm going to raise again from the dead. Well, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is talking to them, and they're asking him, what are the signs of your coming going to be? And so he's going through all these things, just like he did with the disciples. He's giving us a, a diagram, you know, Whenever you work on any kind of piece of equipment, you got a schematic diagram or a flow chart or something. Imagine if you were to take what Jesus says and put that as a mental flow chart or a schematic diagram, he's giving us an outline of what we're living through right now. Because if you look at this, the biggest focus of Matthew 24 or 14 was our uh, theme at camp meeting just a year or so ago. And this gospel, of the kingdom. Remember we sang that song every night? And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. All the world, where is that? China? Have you heard what's going on in China? There are people in China that have religious relics in their homes that the government is coming in, taking the relics down, and putting a picture of Mao Zedong up there and saying, do not mention God anymore. This is just happening this week. One lady, and these are only the people that are on Social Security, their system of Social Security over there. So if you're on a pension over there in China, and you rely on that for your diabetes medicine or whatever, and you say, thank God, they take it away from you. Okay, now God's going to provide for you because the government's not going to provide for you as a Christian. They're even taken, they've even, they have even taken down crosses off of churches. But the gospel of the kingdom has to go to China. It, God has not opened the doors yet to China. But I would not be surprised with all the stuff going on with COVID and everything else if God is not going to open up the doors in China. Wouldn't that be amazing? Remember what, maybe you don't, but in 1991 when the Soviet Union opened to religious freedom, what was that like? There were so many evangelistic opportunities there. What would it be like to go to China and a city of 5, 10 million people show up at your door to hear the gospel being preached? God says this is going to happen. And it, to me, it gives you goosebumps because to be able to speak to so many people that have been oppressed for over 70 years since the communist revolution. You know, some people here, they're sitting here, or their parents have been through religious persecution. They know what it's like. We, most of us, we don't know. But the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come. Jesus was telling us in the future 
we are going to have amazing opportunities. And at Strong Tower Radio, we see that a little bit. Um, since we're streaming, we don't, I don't think we've seen anybody come in from China yet, but that'd be kind of fun. So, you know, just waiting for the day when Jesus comes, we can look forward to that and say, God will provide. So whatever our situations may be, God indeed will provide for us. So. I have the sermon next week. I'm not ready for it this week. <laughs> well. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So, um, one one more thing about the youth group doing these projects. Um, <clears throat> We see this as, an, you know, when we started doing these projects, uh, the kids really want to be able to reach out to the community, but they don't have the ties to the community that many of you might. So if you are working with somebody, like if you have a Bible study that you're working with, or if, you're, if you know somebody that you work with that you've maybe been speaking to about, um, you know, about religious things, and you're looking for that wedge of some way to be able to show them that this church or these kids would care for them and they and be able to do something. We're really looking for some more projects where we could help people in the community. We go to, you know, we've done the field work projects that Chad Bernard sets up down in Detroit and Lansing, and then there's going to be another one in Battle Creek in about a month, or I guess not even a month, about three weeks. Um, and, you know, those are great to see people who, you know, we love helping our church family. Like that's not, we, we still want to be able to help everybody here too. Uh, but if we could reach out to the community, uh, that would be even better. Uh, we, you know, if we could grab some more people and show them that this church on the hill has people that care for them right here in our backyard, um, that would be great for the kids to be able to go out and do that. So they don't have the ability to, you know, our kids are, we have homeschooled kids, we have kids that go to Northview, and we have kids that go to another Christian school. So they're not really getting out into the community very much. They're pretty sheltered batch of kids, right? So they're, they don't know a lot of people that are right here in the community. Let's, but the rest of us get out there. So if we can find ways, and you know somebody that can be, benefit from the kids, um, bring those opportunities to us as well. So the, the kids would like to be able to work on some of those projects as well. So if you think about it, neighbors, um, co-workers, uh, people you're working with, especially people you're working with in the Bible studies, that would be great. Do you have like a time thing where you're like trying to keep it under? Yeah, we, we like one-day projects. So if we could get, you know, a project where the kids could get out there and do something in, you know, three to, three to six hours, those are awesome projects. You know, and, and we get, you know, depending on schedules, I mean, the group doesn't have a lot of drivers yet, right? They're for the most part, they're 11 to 16, 17 maybe. And so there's not, you know, they're, they're kind of at the mercy of when their parents can bring them and we can kind of travel around. So, um, you know, three to six hour projects are great. You know, painting, you know, we're great at demolition. If you've ever seen these kids, uh, it's not shocking probably that they're great at destroying things. Um, but then we start getting into, we've had some requests for some like, uh, <clears throat> more detailed carpentry type work or something that's a really difficult thing that might need to be engineered. Those are probably projects that aren't really well suited for the group. Um, but when it comes to simpler projects, uh, you know, painting, um, we've done a lot of projects where we've kind of cleaned up um, large amounts of brush, you know, you know, not a lot of like just raking up small batches of leaves and things like that. But, you know, some things where they can actually have a bigger project would be great but uh, we try and get them done in a day and we have anywhere usually between what do you say 10 and up to 20 people that show up at these projects so when we have that many um, regardless of the project they can get through it pretty fast so as you think about it if you could think of more projects and bring them to uh, Ava is here she's our community 
She's our outreach coordinator. Ava, can you stand up so everybody knows who you are? She, does, she goes to the Manton Church, but um, she's our outreach coordinator for the group, so she actually talks to the people a lot of times when we have a project and kind of sets it up. And if she's not here, then you could give it to Katie or Peyton or uh, Samuel. All those, uh, all, all those kids can take those requests if you have them. Um, I get a lot of calls for it, but I try and tell everybody that I don't make the decision on whether we're going to go do the project. The kids make these decisions. We bring them to the kids, and I ask them, do you guys, is this a project you guys feel like doing? Um, you know, this is really, we're trying to create the next group of leaders for our church, not the next group of followers, the next group of leaders for the church. So if they only do everything I tell them to do every time that there's something that's going on, we're not going to have a bunch of leaders. We're going to have a bunch of people that are waiting for somebody else to bring them the projects or bring them, uh, you know, point them in the right direction. I give it to them, and then they talk about it. They discuss the merits of the project, and then they decide whether they're going to do it. So if... Uh, I know everybody looks at me for some of these things. Give it to them. Thank you. All right, children's story. Thank you for your patience, by the way. Um, my daughters, <laughs> they love to go into daddy's office because they know that daddy has toys in there. Uh, I'm, I like te technology, and I have little trinkets, and um, they love to play with them and then ask me if they can play with them. <laughs> and so when I got these, uh, my daughter thought these were like phones, because they're shaped kind of like our phones. So um, she couldn't figure out where the screen was, et cetera. And you may not know what it is. Um, and little things like this as well, they love my toys. Um, so this is, this is what I got, and don't you just love it? What is it for, right? Um, this is supposed to help me read. But the problem is that this is a battery pack. And this battery pack has refused to be charged for several times, and not just refused to be charged, it's gotten plugged to stuff that completely drained it. It's completely emptied out all of its power. It refuses to go back to the power source to recharge. So when I need this little battery pack to power my little light at night when I want to read and not disturb my spouse, my wife, or the kids so that they don't know that daddy's still awake and, hey, it's party time, um, this kind of keeps the, the light in front of my book. It fails me every time. But then, um, this is what it's actually supposed to do. And when I put that behind my Bible or behind whatever book I'm reading, my Kindle, um, I can read now because it's connected to an actual source of power. And it's not a big, com convoluted, complex uh, point that uh, this story brings about. It's not so much that these things need to get charged. It's so much as to what I choose to plug into. These two things look identical, and so they could be deceptive. And in today's sermon, we're going to talk about the importance of being plugged into Christ. And the Bible says that there are many antichrists in the earth. And we typically have isolated that many antichrists to just one, big religious system, etc. But the Bible still says that there are many antichrists. There are many false things that look just like Christ, but every human being that plugs into these false Christs will fail to produce light. I mean, Christians evaluate themselves by asking, am I plugged? not whether am I shining. If you ask the right question, you will get the right answer. And the question is, am I bearing fruits? And fruits only come from being connected to the only source of spiritual power on planet Earth, which is Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about in this morning's sermon. Father, I pray that our hearts can be prepared through the simplicity of things that even now we have and the simplicity of this parable of the seed. Glorify yourself, Father, and bless us. Bless us not simply with some nice thoughts. Bless us, Lord, with the presence of your Spirit so that we may experience your power even this morning in our own hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen, Father. So this is our last sermon in a series that has been building up. Um, 
and it's entitled Much Fruit. And it's not simply what many, for many years I had made out this parable to be. This is a parable series that I preached many times, but never like this. This is uh, actually fresh insight that the Lord has brought to me. Um, we've talked about the, the, the types of soil Jesus warns us against. The hardened, stony, and weedy soils, which end up being the soil of indifference, superficiality, and the heart that's monopolized. We talked about that last Sabbath, the heart that is too busy to pray, too busy to spend time with the Lord, too busy to, to be with the Lord, really. I used to use this sermon to guilt people. I used to preach this close to nominating committee to kind of guilt people into accepting positions. You know, it, don't get so busy with the world that you don't have time for the Lord. We have, you know, potluck committee. Who wants potluck committee? Oh. And so I would use this to kind of, you know, put the little tourniquet of guilt in my members. I didn't have a clue that there were people that were busy in the church that were not spending time with Jesus because they were so busy in the church. And so through church planting and other experiences, I've realized that you need to gauge yourself. And if you're biting more than you can chew, then you're not eating. If you're biting more than you can chew, you're not eating. And if you're not eating, you're dying. And Jesus will not ask you to do something for him for you to die spiritually. That's what he told Martha. Martha, Martha, you are anxious about too many things. So now I, I, nominating committee for me is actually evaluating the health of my leaders. Are you healthy? Is your prayer life thriving? Or is you serving the Lord keeping you from the Lord? I'd much rather you be with the Lord than serve him. Because to have a leader that's disconnected from the Lord, we don't get what we would like to get. For them, aren't for the church. So these, these are warning soils that Jesus spent quite a bit of time with, but this morning we're going to spend time looking at the final soil, the soil that Jesus aims and continually appeals and calls us to be. If you're familiar with geography, you'll know that that arrow is pointing to an island owned by uh, Norwegian, uh, Norway, a Norwegian island. And in that island is something that I came across some years ago in a documentary. blew my mind away. I didn't know this place existed. It seemed like something straight out of science fiction. Um, is the is Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Anyone hear of this vault before? Good. Uh, some people have. Um, if you haven't, you can go to this website, croptrust.org, and get a virtual tour. It's really cool. I did it last night. You actually go through the tunnels as if you're walking through them. You can pan. If you have one of those VR goggles, you can actually do one of these things and feel like you're inside. And uh, you go through the different doors, security doors. And then you enter this chamber where there's um, three vaults, huge vaults. And they house about, potentially, they can house about four and a half million seeds. And the reason that this place was created was because we realized we've come to a point in Earth's history where through biochemical uh, things and nuclear warfare, we could nuke half the planet overnight and lose so much of our food supply. And not just food supply, but plants that we can never replace. So this place was created in an area where it's super cold year-round. And the reason was that we, they wanted a place that they didn't have to invest so much energy keeping cold. So there's no heater built into this place. And it's, it, it goes deep into the mountains so that the temperature is steadily cold. It's, I forget how many degrees below zero centigrade. So it's below, below freezing point. And the seeds that are stored in this place can be kept for thousands of years intact. So should you know, buttons be pressed and missiles be sent and nuclear warfare it destroy most of the human life, at least if that place doesn't get hit, <laughs> um, we should be able to replant. Actually, this was, um, became useful some years ago when Aleppo was attacked by Syria. And I'm not going to get into all the logistics, simply say that Aleppo was destroyed, this decimated by Syria and the Russian allies that they had. And when Aleppo was destroyed, um, so was all of their ag agronomy, so all their farms and everything was completely obliterated. And they had stored seeds in this place. So after the war ended and they were in the process of rebuilding, they went to the seed vault and said, um, we want our lentil seeds and our garbanzo seeds and wheat seeds that grow best in our climate. 
they're, they're local. And they were able to rebuild back what was lost through the war. And it dawned on me. I'm talking about Fort Knox, you know, buy gold, buy gold, because they never depreciate. The problem is you can't eat it, right? So I realized the highest commodity on planet Earth are these seas. This is one place that we have now made it the most valuable place on planet Earth. There are over 50,000 seeds that the United States has sent over there that are, that are strictly from here. Argentina has sent about 120. All that information is on the website. Don't think I'm a whiz. I, I read it last night. So. But I was interested. Argentina sent stuff there. Much of South America has sent uh, seeds there. Of course, we've sent seeds there, which drove home, drove home what the simplicity of the parable of Jesus, that something that we take so for granted, seeds, are really the essence that keeps us alive. You take seeds from planet Earth, and you've removed anything and everything that can keep us alive. I want to thank you guys that you keep uh, filling our fridge with goodies, uh, green beans and peas and kale, lots of kale around. <laughs> uh, we're going to be fortified with iron. <laughs> um, and for me, it's, none of that would happen. Your, your garden would be barren if we didn't have seeds, which drives home further the point of the primacy of the scriptures. How important is that one thing that we take for granted? God's word. Without it, we wouldn't have life. We're going to get back to this in a little bit. I'm going to tell you a story that is, though I made it up. Uh, I made it up because I've heard it. And so it's a conglomerate of many real stories into a fictitious story with a point, a parable. A young couple gets married, and where they live is, is too prohibitive to buy land and uh, build a home, probably East Coast, like the Boston area, New York area. Uh, real estate is crazy expensive there. And so they're looking at other parts of the country, and they find a plot of land online, and they travel to the place. They look at it. It's beautiful. They can't believe it's so cheap. They buy it, and now they have all these excess funds to build a home, and the home materials are not expensive at all in that area either. And boom, they're, as they're finalizing their home, putting the final touches, the builder says, it's time to dig, drill your well. And as they drill, they realize, oh, by the way, has anyone told you about that factory nearby? It's been here for decades. And they've controlled the, the powers that be so that they're allowed to dump all their chemical residue carelessly. There's really no monitoring. Because they produce so much jobs, so many jobs, and there's kind of like the center of the economy here, they can pretty much do as they please. So I hate to tell you that you can't drink your water. It's, it's loaded with lead, mercury, and a whole bunch of other toxins. And the couple is distraught, brokenhearted. Our dream home is falling apart because of the water? Seriously. So they scrounge up some more funds and say, we're going to dig deeper. We're going to go to the deeper water bases. And as they do so, the gentleman says, oh, I'm so sorry, but the factory has been here so long. You cannot go deep enough to escape the pollution. So the couple now is looking at their losses, trying to figure out, should we sell it for how much? Will anyone want to buy it? No wonder that land was so cheap here. We should have asked more questions. And as it happens, and during those times, sometimes the parents give calls. And you may think it's the most inopportune time. You know, you, oh, he's my mother-in-law. What a perfect timing to be calling. Um, but this is a good mother-in-law, like the one that I have. I have a, one of the world's best mother-in-laws, and I love Linda. She's a blessing to my life and my family. So the answer, hi, Mom. No, we're not good. And they tell the whole thing. And then the mom, a very insightful woman, familiar with the area, tells them, um, honey, I think you may be looking in the wrong direction. You're trying to find fresh water by going deeper down. You need to look up. Look to the other side of the factory. There's a huge mountain there. Do you see it? It's snow camp year round. And have you noticed that it produces fresh clouds every day? And the wind actually flows from the mountain towards the factory. So none of that pollution ever makes it up to that mountain. You need to figure out a way not to get water from the earth, but get water from heaven. 
you got to stop looking to satisfy your need from down here. You got to look to satisfy your need from up there. That is the only place where you get pure water that will allow you to live in your home. Mark 7, 21 through 23 says, from, from, For from what part, church? From within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things, all these evil thoughts come from where, church? Yeah. From within. Uh, pick a movie from Pixar. Pick a movie from any studio. Uh, G to R. Pick, pick a film. Pick a book. Pick a course in college in philosophy. Pick a course in college in history. And you will hear this theme, this reoccurring theme. The goal of life, you will, you will understand how to make the best out of life when you invest in looking for the good inside of you. Look within. That's where the answers lie. The answers are within you. You just have to go deep enough. And what the Bible says is it doesn't matter how deep enough you go, you will only find more and more pollution. The, the more the, wa the water gushes out, I mean, the, the couple was smart. Because what gushed out was not brown sludge. What gushed out was crystal clear water that had no odors or nothing like that. It wasn't until it was tested that these toxins were identified. A dear friend of mine that was a pastor in Pennsylvania, he was a Bible worker, a big influence in my life, Skip. He got married and him and his wife bought a farm house. They loved it. It was beautiful, huge. Um, he came with a big, huge uh, oven that uh, he made it to use granola. I thought, what a waste. That's for pizza. Um, I was like, wow, what an amazing blessing. Several years later, their children are, are experiencing cognitive maladies and mood swings, and they're experiencing things that they never had before. They go and get tested, and, and they have lead in their blood, high levels, and so do their children. And they go to a place, I think it's called Weimar out west, and they have a detox process that uh, takes these things, and they, it's very laborious. It's very difficult to get out of your system. Sometimes missionaries that have been in overseas during the 60s, 70s, or before, and they get dental work overseas, um, they begin to experience some of these things because the fillings that still other countries, some other countries use have lead in it, and it will bleach into your body. So Skip and his wife and his family, pr praise the Lord, were spared from this, but it could have cost them their life. They never tasted it. They never smelled it. It's water. And water is water, right? The Bible's continual appeal is not everything that looks like water is water. And not everything that looks like it's going to satisfy you will. You are so convinced that your career will satisfy you because that's where your identity comes from. To espouse that, to marry yourself to that, is setting you up for failure because one day you may change careers or you may retire, and then where's you? Who's you? If all you were was a welder, a dentist, an accountant, whatever it is that you were, when you retire, what are you now? There's a statement from a book called Adventist Home that helped me a lot when I was a single young man in my 30s, which when you convert that from Spanish years, that's like being 80, because there are expectations. By 30, I should have been close to becoming a grandpa. Get married in your early 20s, have your kids like the next year, <laughs> several of them. And uh, there was all these cultural expectations. And I was like, Lord, I'm single and 30. And God was like, listen, son, open that book right there. It's not just a fancy title. It's actually something that will help you. And there was one sentence that stuck with me. This sentence says this. The human heart yearns for human love. The human heart yearns for what kind of love, church? Human love. The next sentence says, but that love is not strong enough, pure enough, nor steadfast enough. The next sentence says, only the love of Jesus. We are not evil, corrupt individuals. It is a natural thing 
to think, to be convinced that that which comes from down here will satisfy my needs. But the Bible's constant counterintuitive message is that no matter how deep you go, no matter how deep you dig, it doesn't matter how clear it looks, it will fail you at satisfying you. One of the sure signs that you're maturing as an adult is that you begin to recognize the flaws of your parents and you still love them. It is not a, mature, a sign of maturity that you can identify your parents' flaws and throw it in their faces. That is a sign of immaturity. Are you following, church? Just because you can tell that your dad does these things or he's not consistent with this or that and you're throwing that in your dad's face or your mom's face, that is not a sign of maturity. A sign of maturity is when you can identify people's flaws and still love them, still respect them. But it is quite the journey when the daddy that picked you up in his arms, whom you secretly wanted to marry someday when you get older, that daddy that was the strongest, most handsomest man on planet Earth, he begins to dawn on you that he's a broken human being too. See, God is preparing the minds for this experience of much fruit. What is much fruit? Much fruit is an experience that a human being has when we stop, stop seeking for what we're yearning for down here, and by faith begin to look for it from heaven. John 3.27 says, A man can receive nothing good, nothing holy, nothing pure, nothing lasting, unless it has been given him from what, pl what place? From heaven. It's the only place. Another sh short parable that doesn't require hardly any explanation at all. When Paul speaks about the first Adam and Jesus being the second Adam, this is simply what he's saying. That first Adam, because of sin, he severed his relationship with God. And all his kids are born like that. With a cable that doesn't reach heaven. With a cable that doesn't connect to God, the only source of satisfaction, identity, and purpose in life. That's why when Jacob fled his house after having received what he was looking for so much through deception and lies, and he thought, I'm a dead man. My, my brother's going to find me. His, his uh, servants are going to find me, and I'm a dead man, and I've lost my home, and I, I thought I was gaining something by stealing it, and I've lost so much through it. And he's feeling discouraged, and he's probably thinking, I've even probably lost God. At that moment, he had a dream of a ladder, a ladder that... It's not like the ladders that I would see in the neighborhoods that I grew up in, those fire ladders that only go down so far, and then you've got to jump. It's to prevent people from breaking into your house. It's so that you can get out of the fire and not burn up. But you've got to still jump quite a distance. Those ladders never touch the ground. But the ladder in Jacob's dream was touching heaven, and it touched earth too. And angels of God were ascending and descending, and Jesus says, that's me. I am what has jo joined humanity from God. I am that venue, that conduit. I am that cloud that brings the waters that will refresh you and satisfy your soul. So stop looking for that in your boyfriend or your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your children, or your parents, or wherever else, the multiplicity of places where we dig, dig, trying to find it, trying to get it. Stop looking down. We've got to start looking up. It's the only place where we can find what our souls are yearning for. John 15, 5, through 8, 5 and 8 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do how much, church? But by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples twice, Jesus emphasizes, not just that we produce fruit, but that we produce much fruit. And in this parable of the seed... The goal is not to have roots or stems or leaves or branches. The real goal of the seed is to make fruit. And Jesus takes this concept of fruit and attaches that word much and says it with a smile. You see, we don't know what much fruit is. And that's God's desire and expectation for you to take him at his word and begin to allow the seed of his word the seed of what's powerful, the, 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 the source of really where you will find yourself, you will find and discover God. God is saying what's, what's contained in this book, 
the words that have been inspired by the Holy Spirit will bring into you this experience called much fruit. And this is where a, a branch of Christianity has made it into an abhorrent perversion, and that's the, the prosperity gospel message. That this much fruit is in, is in reference to your bank account. If you start tithing, God will make your bank account grow. That's not true. Tithing is not about you paying God so that God can give you a raise and a promotion. That's paganism. It has nothing to do with grace. It has nothing to do with the gospel. So we have to be careful how we talk about stewardship. What is much fruit? I used to read that verse and not like it because I felt like, oh man, Lord, I'm trying to be a good Christian and it's leaving me exhausted and now you want more fruits from me? It's like, man, talk about, you know? It's like, Lord, you're like my grandma in Argentina. She refused to get, throw away the toothpaste. You know of people that take the, the back end of the toothbrush and squish and scrape and try to get that last girl. You know, they stick their bristles down the head neck, trying to scoop, and then they take a razor blade. My grandpa's razor blade, my grandma would dissect the toothpaste and open it and see, there you go, there you go, right here. That, this is why. Look, look, two more brush, brushes right here. I would have thrown it away in the trash. That's how I felt God was with me. The tithe, the Sabbath puts my job at jeopardy. The Sabbath puts me as a dork in school because I don't go to the dances and I don't do these sports and I don't play soccer on Sabbath. What more do you want? You're costing me my social life. I'm not cool in school. You're costing me possible jobs and raises because of the Sabbath. And now you want much fruit from me? What, is what I'm giving you not enough? This is still unconverted language. And if you've been thinking that this idea of much fruit has to do with you, I'm glad you're here this morning. Because no soil ever says to the gardener, have you checked out my tomatoes? The soil knows that if there's anything that grows that produces fruit, it's because of the seed, not the soil. And when Jesus says, I want you to produce much fruit, what God is asking is, let me work in your life because I will produce the fruits in you. And I don't want just a little bit. I want you to produce much. My parents are amateur, well, I think I'm more experienced now, but I remember the first time my parents, my dad retired, he got a little antsy, and um, looked at my mom and said, uh, Maria, in Argentina, we both grew up with, you know, our parents planting stuff. My grandma, my, my grandma, my dad's mom, had an avocado tree, papaya tree, a fig tree, and a whole bunch of herbs growing in the house. So my dad grew up with, you know, my brother and I, we would climb the avocado tree and pick fresh avocados and have those in a salad. So my dad's like, I've missed that. We've never done this. Why don't we plant cherry tomatoes? I love cherry tomatoes, and they're so expensive. I know, Alfredo, let's do cherry tomatoes. Well, you can tell amateur gardeners planting cherry tomatoes because they plant a lot of plants. <laughs> they're thinking, it's just the two of us. Five plants? Let's do six just to be safe. Seven, seven. It's a perfect number. So my parents had cherry tomato plants. And that summer, my parents, their vitamin C shot through the roof. Their lycopene in their blood system was just like super high. Whatever was damaged in their arteries, all that goodness, all those antioxidants were just, they became a tomato smoothie with legs. <laughs> they would come to church pleading with people, please take them. Kind of like some of you with your kale, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're wonderful chips here. <laughs> Cherry tomatoes, my parents could not have imagined such a tiny little plant filling every nook and cranny of their refrigerator. One plant, they had five of them. Two of them, I think some, something killed it. 
But they could not believe how much fruit one seed could produce. And what this morning's sermon is not about you being squished and dissected to get one last scoop of toothpaste out of you is to challenge how big you think God really is. Is to challenge us into this experience called much fruit. I'm learning a lot about gardening. I'm, I'm gleaning. I, once I get curious about things, I get very inquisitive. And this thought occurred to me as I was putting the sermon together last night. Everything that's the seed, everything that's seed is in here, right? Um, every, anything that's inside of this little thing is seed. And it's not rocket science, but it is to me now because of this simple reason. Um, so what are these things right here? See, we like to label things. And that's part of our God-given nature. God said, name the animals. So we like to name things. We like taxonomy. We like, you know, to label each little bones. But even though we have identified little bones right here, this is a finger, right? It's a finger. And though we would call that a root, really, where did that root come from? And that root was already in the seed. It had just not expressed itself yet. So in technical terms, and for me, in real terms, we should be able to say that this is seed. A seed that has been expanding and becoming what the seed always has been. Because it's being given time and because the, the seed is abiding in the soil, the seed is expanding. So for the sake of this sermon, this is still seed. So let me ask you about this. What, what would this be then? See, you would say that this right here is roots, this is the branch, and these are the leaves, etc., etc. No, 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 no. Because everything that's here was already where? In the seed. It just had not expressed itself. But everything that we visibly see coming out of the seed was in the seed already. The last one, I think you know where I'm going with this. So what is this? That's a seed. And the powerful thing is that it begins with a seed and it ends with fruit. But what's inside each of those fruits? This is the experience God is speaking of. This is what Jesus says. If you abide in me and I abide in you, he doesn't simply say you will produce fruit. He says you will produce much fruit. Much fruit. And we're preparing. We still haven't identified what that experience means. We're just gradually taking steps to deconstruct legalistic and all these other ways that we've been interpreting this passage and actually do it both through the spiritual book of nature and the spiritual divine book of special revelation, the Bible. Everything that the tree manifests itself was already in the seed. This insight, as, as, as I conclude, I'm like, Lord, am I going somewhere with this? Is this good? I, I, I was reminded of this quote from the book Education, page 253, that says, the seed is the word of God. As surely as the oak, big tree, is in the what? Acorn. And the acorn is just the, the name, the identified name, but it actually speaks of the seed. That big oak was inside that the seed. The seed is what leads to the production of the big seed, which produces more fruit, which produces more seed. Stick with me. We still haven't identified much fruit. We are just preparing ourselves for the punchline. And I can almost assure you that the punchline, I hope, will catch you off guard as much as it caught me off guard. Jesus identifies himself as ultimately that seed. Jesus is the word of God that became flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. And Jesus says, the seed is the word. It's not the, the individual letters that magically do something inside of me. It's the message that these words convey into my thoughts and feelings. 
And it's not just that by information I become transformed. The Holy Spirit takes what these divine revelations are and begins to imbue them and attach them to my thoughts and feelings so that I can begin to have this experience that Paul spoke of. I have been crucified with Christ. There's the abiding, there's the connection. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but who lives in me? Christ. The seed, the living word, is alive in me. It's not information. Nicodemus had information, and yet he had not been born again. He had taught decades people in the synagogues about the God of heaven, yet when he stood face to face with Yahweh, he didn't recognize him. He could not understand what Jesus was telling him, and Jesus was astonished and said, I'm trying to break it down as simple as possible for you. How can you not get it and be a teacher? And Jesus was not trying to call him out and, and, and shame him. Jesus was trying to spur him. This is what you're doing. You're asking the God of heaven to take your cherry tree, your, your, your cherry tomato seeds, and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to put it here. Could you possibly consider in your mighty power to give me 10 cherry tomatoes? And God is looking saying, that's not what I made that seed to do. Nicodemus, not that I want fruit in you. It's that I want much fruit in you. You think you're going to get it from religion? Church membership? Paul, can you please explain to us what is this much fruit stuff that pastor keeps talking about? Ephesians 4, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly. Paul's like trying to, he's like, what, what more can I say? What more can I use? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. There's that word again, in us. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly all these superlatives. Because Paul is trying to push us to recognize that when we talk, when he says uh, it, that we ask or think, in what spiritual experience do we ask things from God? When we do what, we ask things from God. What is that? prayer. So what Paul is saying here is, you Christians, us Christians, our prayers don't even come close to what God is able to do for us. You think you're asking God for huge things when you say, okay, Lord, can we like do 20 cherry tomatoes? Is that okay with you? And God's like, how about 200? How about 2,000? And you're like, I never thought to ask that much. See, when we talk about much fruit, it requires something. It requires much faith. And what God is challenging us as humans is that your faith has atrophied because from the day you're born, you're attaching your faith to a daddy that will eventually let you down. You're attaching it to a mommy that no matter how good and nice she is, she's imperfect. And the human heart yearns for human love, yearns for affirmation from other human beings. Once my daughter gets to a certain age, her friends will be like her source of affirmation and identity. And then after that, Jesus will come because she's not going to get to the age of having a boyfriend. Praise the Lord. I'm praying for that. I don't want that day when a Philistine walks through the doors of my house and I have to pull out the sling. Oh, Lord, help me. Mercy. I don't know how Bob did it, honestly. Austin, I'm going to have to like, pick your brain. It's a scary thought. Because hopefully by then, hopefully by the time, and I'm joking, of course, he's not going to be a Philistine. I'm praying for a God-fearing man. Hopefully, though, no matter how holy and righteous and whatever this young man be, Hopefully by then, my, my daughters, or my oldest daughter at least, 
I've been given the wisdom to help her see that, honey, no man, no human being will ever be able to fill your heart with love. You will naturally crave it from your friends or from him. Honey, no one could love you more than mommy and daddy down here. But hopefully, you've come to experience in your own life that there is someone that does love you more than mommy and daddy does. His name is Jesus Christ. Only his love, honey. And that's probably my question. Maybe I should re listen to the sermon that day. Because that's probably the question that I need to ask that young man. Do you love my daughter more than anything? Do you love her above everything and anything in this planet? If he says yes, I'm kicking him out of the house. I need to write that down. <laughs> That's a good trap. <laughs> Sorry, honey, they keep giving me the wrong answer. When they give me the right answer, they can stay. So you tell me, what's the right answer? Why, am I, why is the pastor kicking a boy out when he says, I love your daughter more than anything on this planet? Why am I kicking him out? He needs, to, he needs to tell me, no, Pastor Mr. Ariel rolled on, because if they don't call me anything beyond that, it's no conversation, right? <laughs> God's going to confront me on that day. Pray for me. We. If he tells me, Mr. Ariel, I will never choose your daughter over Jesus. And if your daughter ever loses her faith and walks away from the Lord, I'm sticking with the Lord. I love God more than my parents, more than her. I'm going to hug him, and I'm going to say we need to pray, and don't change. So if you're looking for a girlfriend, ask them that. Do you love me more than anything? Yeah, break up. <laughs> you will save yourself a lot of heartache, because humans that want to get from another human what no human can, be, can, can give, are setting themselves up for a lifelong of failure, frustration, and brokenness. Only Jesus, amen. amen. So this idea of much fruit, Paul is trying to push us. You've made God so tiny. You've made God too small. We're going to give you a look at this now from the, the, the idea of the apostles in just a little bit. Um, this is the Amplified Translation. The Amplified Bible says it like this. Now, to him who, by the action of his power that is at work within us, is able to do, look at these, how they translated the superlatives, super abundantly, far above, far over, and above all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, our highest desires, our highest thoughts, hopes, or dreams. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We read, I read those verses and I think, oh, that's nice. So it's 40 cherry tomatoes. Huh. Oh, I see. Yeah. To him who is able to abundantly, exceedingly I'll do more than I could ask or think. That's a, such a nice verse. They should make a bumper sticker out of it. The Word of God this morning is challenging me and is challenging you with the, with the correct assumption that no matter how, God, how big you think God is today, He's bigger. And no matter how big you think you've prayed to Him, you haven't outprayed what God is able to do for you. You cannot out-ask what God is capable and willing to do for you. We haven't reached the limit. And we're going to see that just now. Mark 4, 38 through 41. Jesus was in the stern asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, listen to this prayer. I never thought about this as prayer, but really prayer means the human talking to the divine. That's all prayer is. Me talking to God. And so the disciples are talking to Jesus. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So let me ask you, 
Why did the disciples wake Jesus up for? Why did the disciples wake Jesus up for? They're scared, but they were scared for quite some time. Why wake Jesus up? To rebuke him. First words out of their mouth. Wake up! Wake up! Don't you care? I remember in Spanish, of course, as a kid, reading, hearing the pastor talk about this verse, thinking, boy, if I was Jesus, I would tell the disciples a few words. How dare you say, do I care? And for 25 years, well... For uh, almost 20 of the 25 years that I was an illegal immigrant in this country, I would say that to God. Hold up, hold up a second. This is happening a year after I graduate high school. You're going to leave me hanging in this country like this? My younger brother got his green card. You're doing this to me now? Seriously? This is the worst timing. I was already enrolled in college. I had already been approved for finance. What? I have to cancel. What am I, so what am I going to do now? What am I supposed to do now? Why are you messing with my life like this? Don't you care? I'm at the prime of my life right now. All my friends are going to college. And what am I going to do? Just go back to my job and what? Be poor? Be a nobody? And my church tried. My church tried... I think I may have already told you, my youth leader, after years of trying this way and that way, almost, 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 and the doors were closed, continually slapped, slammed on my face. It wasn't like a gentle closing. It was like a bam. No, you're staying in that condition. You are going to stay illegal immigrant. After years of trying, my youth leader, whom I love as an older brother, said, Ariel, my brother works, uh, he's a, rep a state representative in Pennsylvania. I'm going to make, him, make some phone calls. I'm going to use all the, the, the weight that I possibly can muster. I'm going to try to adopt you, Ariel. I'm going to adopt you. My parents were okay with it. My parents just wanted me to be able to stay and have a life. And when Bob called his brother that worked in the capital of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, his brother called him and said, it's unbelievable, Bob, but I just can't help this young man. I've tried everything I possibly can. I wish I could, but I can't. See, this storm paled in comparison to the storm inside the hearts of the disciples. You have to do in the context. The disciples felt that Jesus blew it, messed it up. At the worst possible time, Jesus blew it. He's just fed 5,000 people. They're ready to proclaim him king. He sends them away, and he gets on a boat and says, puts them on a boat and says, go, 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 go. The storm inside their hearts was raging more than the storm outside of them. That's why when they woke Jesus, they said, you don't care for us, do you? How come you don't answer my prayers, Lord? See, we're starting prayer meeting again this week. Amen. Amen. We're, starting prayer meeting, we're starting prayer meeting again this week. Amen. We're starting prayer meeting again this week. Amen. 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 And prayer meeting is a place sometimes of pain and torture. Because you come to prayer meeting and you hear sister so-and-so said, God is an amazing God. We serve a mighty living Savior. I was praying about him for this and boom, 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 boom. It happened. God hears prayers. Amen. Sister, brother so-and-so will go, I have to testify. I cannot keep quiet. I was been praying this for years and God finally, this week, this week, boom, 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 boom. And he answers me. And I'm looking and that's why my prayer, I stopped going to prayer meeting. I couldn't take it. I couldn't take others testifying of a God that not only heard prayers but answered them and he was not answering mine. Therefore, he probably is not hearing me. I'm too sinful. And I was. I was not living a Christian. I was keeping the Sabbath, but that was the only commandment I was keeping. I was breaking every single one of the other ones, which, of course, you don't keep any. Don't you care for me? So I'm going to ask you some questions, so I hope you're paying attention. 
But he said to them, Why are you fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So here's the first thinking question that I have for you. Um, what was Jesus' response to their, their question? What was Jesus' response to their question? Don't you care that we are perishing? How did Jesus answer that question? Why are you afraid? I, I answer that, and that's a good answer. But I've come to realize that there are times that Jesus doesn't answer through a sermon or audibly like we wish. He answers with actions. Master, don't you care that we are perishing? And what does Jesus do immediately? Calms the storm. Is that an answer, yes or no? Was that supposed to be the answer that Jesus gave them? Yes. What was Jesus' answer by calming the storm? Master, don't you care for us? And Jesus calms the storm. What's the answer? How could you ask? How come you weren't sleeping like I was? How come you have no faith? It's not that they had no faith. It's that they had their faith in something down here, earthly kingdom, earthly power, earthly control. Polluted, polluted, polluted. And Jesus is saying, you don't have faith in me. Look at your language. Look at the language of the disciples. Uh, I'm going to ask you some questions. Oops. Uh. That word right there is so important in this passage. Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? What does that mean, even? What does it mean, even? There was a cap. Um, if I walk up to the disciples and I say, hey, guys, come here. I have a question for you guys. Can your Messiah heal the blind? Yes, he can. Can your Messiah heal the paralyzed? Yes, he can. Can he feed 5,000 people with like five loaves and two fishes? Yes, he can. Can he calm the waves and the seas? No, no, he can't do that one. He can't do that one. So my question for you this morning is, what do you believe God cannot do for you? Because there is something. We all have it. We all have these unidentified, unspecific, but they're there, caps as to what we believe God is capable of doing for us. That's why Paul says, to him who is able to exceedingly, abundantly do above all that we could possibly ask him or even think to ask him. The disciples didn't wake Jesus up to say, Master, can you please calm the storm? It was like, Jesus, my arm's tired. Here, you start rowing. You have fresh arms. You've been resting. That's why they, joke, they woke Jesus up, to rebuke him and to say, Jesus, you get moving. We're going to sink. They didn't even, they thought, they didn't cross their minds that here before them was someone that had the power to calm storms. So they never bothered to ask. You this morning have things that you are convinced God cannot do. And so God allows a storm not to kill you or destroy you, but to reveal what you don't believe about him. To reveal to you what you have ascribed to him is a limit he possesses when you are actually serving and worshiping a limitless God, a God that has no limit to the power that he has for you. And in proportion to his power is his love for you. What do you believe God cannot do for you? We all have that. And the storms and the painful things in life can help us identify that. There are prayers that we are praying right now that are too small, too weak, too limiting. The much fruit experience will always stretch our faith in what God can abundantly do in and through us. Like the disciples, we also will find ourselves declaring, He is able to even do this. I never thought you could. Powerful reality. God will do what we can't even imagine to think or ask of him, but he will do this to rebuke our lukewarm faith. See, the sequence is beautiful in this instance because Jesus wakes up and the storm is raging and they say, Master, don't you care that we are perishing? Jesus doesn't say, do you believe that I can calm this storm? Hey, does anyone here believe that I can calm this storm? If you don't believe, I'm not calming it. I'm not calming this storm until you believe. Jesus doesn't do that. 
which is a powerful revelation because I grew up thinking that God is waiting for me to have sufficient faith in what he's able to do so that then he can do what he think, I think he can do for me. But it doesn't work like that when you don't even think God can do something for you. So he does it anyways. He does the things that we don't have the faith to believe we can ask from him. That is a mind-blowing reality of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Why does God do this? To stretch our faith. To cause us to grow. I forgot to do this at the children's story, and I think this is a good time to do it because we're running out of steam. A prayer, a camp meeting, not this last one, but the one before, we always have these songs that we do with children. Oh, now I know why I didn't do it, because we don't sing here still. <laughs> I'll sing it from back here, and you can uh, sing it in your head. We can do the motions, though. Do you guys like singing children's song? Let's do this. The song is, goes like this. Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day. Pray every day, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. If you want to sing it, we're going to sing it together. And we've got to do the motions so that we can get some blood flow. <laughs> Ready? One more time. Read your Bibles, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bibles, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. What grows? Your faith. The disciples' faith grew exponentially after the storm because now if I walked up to them and said, can your Savior calm the storms, what would be their emphatic answer? We didn't think he could, but he blew my mind away when he did it. Who is this? that even the seas and the waves obey him. We're going to conclude with this story. Genesis is my favorite book of the Bible because of the stories of one family that is so broken, so destroyed by sin, and God shows how he saves our families. Jacob, Genesis 45, 25 to 28, and then 48, 11 says, Then they, Joseph's brothers, went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and he is a governor over all, over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still. Why? Because he what? Did not believe him. And before we judge him too harshly, this is a father that when they brought the torn robe of many colors, he didn't want to believe that his son was dead. The, the brothers never said, we found him, we found this. I'm wondering if Jacob held in his heart the hopes that maybe the animals didn't fully take his life and some people found him and bandaged him up and he's healing in some village and someday he'll walk through the, the tents of his, of his home. As a nurse and in my own life, I've said goodbye to people and it's so weird how the brain works because you swear you, you heard their voice. When a mother loses her child, she still hears the voice of that child for many years. When a husband loses his wife or a wife loses her husband, and they reach over after so many years of having that person next to you, and you reach over in the mornings like you always did, and that person is no longer there. It took years for Jacob to bring closure and say, my son's dead. So it's natural that he would now say, it's just silly, what are you talking about? My son's dead. And he would not believe. But the brothers keep insisting and then bring out the evidence. Of course, it has to be. Could it be? Could it possibly be? But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the cards which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, came alive again. Hope revived inside of Jacob. Then Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him. So we think, wow, this is amazing. God is blowing uh, Jacob's faith you know, to brand new proportions, brand new heights. Not so. Jacob struggled to believe that he would see Joseph. 
But listen to how this story concludes. Then Jacob said to Joseph, I never thought I would see your face again. But now who? God has let me see what? Jacob never prayed that. Jacob would have never thought or imagined to ask God, it's not just simply, can I see my son, but can I see my children? And by the way, can I see my son as second in command in a world empire? Can you do that for me, God? Jacob would have never dreamed of ever asking the God of heaven to do that for him. Yet God did. Jacob was convinced, I'm never going to see Joseph. And what he got to see exceeded abundantly above all he could think or ask God to do for him in his life. Are you, are you following, church? Are you understanding that much fruit doesn't have to do about you doing more, but you experiencing more of God's power in your life that blows your mind away as to what he can do? You and I have capped him, and these caps that we bring to God's power allows us to say words like, Joseph, I thought I would never. My son probably will never set foot back in a church again. This marriage will never work. I will never see so-and-so. This relationship is so broken. Joseph could have said that. The brothers could have said that. Jacob could have said, my family is just so messed up. My children will never love each other. Our church has suffered so, so many wounds. We can never experience the love that we're supposed to have for each other. You and I serve a God that wants to erase the word never from our vocabulary. I never saw, thought I'd see your face again. These are my grandkids. These are my grandchildren. My imagination fails to try to picture how Jacob is re reacting to this tsunami of the gospel in his life. Even this, even this. Joseph, statement was to his brothers, but as for you, you meant evil against me. But only God can take our pain, our dysfunction, and make it for good. Why does God do this? See, this is the, see it's, it's not just... Jacob and Joseph, what they're all blown away is not Jake, just Jacob blown away at how Joseph has been, been preserved. He's second in command in Egypt, and he has grandkids. He has kids. It's not just Jacob being blown away. It's Joseph too. Joseph also had put a cap. The last memory that Joseph had for years was the day when his brothers sold him as a slave, mocking and deriding him and telling him, I hate your guts. You're lucky I didn't kill you. you consider yourself lucky that we're selling you as a slave because I, if I would have been up to me, I would have killed you. I hate you. Those were the parting words Joseph lived with for decades. He thought he had processed that, right? until the day his brothers walk into his palace. And when he sees his brothers, all those emotions, all those memories flood his imagination. And it's, like, it's as if that's happened five minutes ago. You know what I'm talking about? And Joseph now has a choice. Where will I plug? I'm second in command in Egypt. I could have these guys impaled in a second. <laughs> oh God, you're an amazing God. You have delivered my enemies before me. You're an amazing God, Lord. I never thought I would pray about this, but thank you. I'm going to have my brothers erased from the planet. Actually, no, and I'm killing them. No, 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 no. I'm going to make them my slaves. Yes, that's, there you go. I'm going to make them my slaves. He could have plugged into this. But Joseph made choices at Potiphar's wife in the jail. And on that trip from Canaan to Egypt, if I abide in you and you abide in me, I will produce much fruit. 
And this fruit is about character transformation, not about getting a raise or a promotion or a bigger house. It's about your character being transformed by the power of God. And Joseph's mind is about to be blown away in an identical way as his father Jacob. Because Joseph is plugged on in and the voice of the Holy Spirit is saying, just wait a second. Do you think, if I've done this for you, Joseph, what do you think I can do for them? Lord, you don't know my brothers. They will never love each other. They will never do this. They will never act like brothers. Our family, Lord, you have no idea how messed up my family is, Lord. There's just some things that I think are beyond you, honestly. And if there's anything like that, it's my family. I don't think my brother, test them. Test them. And Joseph begins to put test after test that begin to reveal to him that there is no limit to the power of God. And when the final test comes and Benjamin is there, and he says, this young guy stays with me. You guys go back. Go. You're free to go. And his brothers begin to say, no, take me. Make me your slave. Joseph is moved. Joseph is moved because his heart's not the only one that's been changed. You think God is only working in your heart? You think God is not working in people that are not present here this morning? You guys love each other that much? It's just that I, we love our dad, and we've already heard him many years ago. We didn't realize what we have done. We were so immature. We did something really messed up, and my dad almost died, but it's not going to happen again. We're not doing this again. Take me. I'll stay. Let the younger brother go. And every time I read that part of the Bible, I get teary-eyed because that's what God did in my family and in my life. Blew my mind away. Realized for almost 20 years, I had been praying tiny, puny, insignificant prayers while worshiping a most powerful, infinite God. And I didn't know it. What is your never? You will never love someone. You will never heal from something someone has done for you, to you. What is your never? I will never see this person ever again in church. God wants to give you more fruit in your life. Do you want to see God's much fruit in your life? Who this morning wants to see God's much fruit in your life, in your life experience? It will require your faith to be stretched. Instead of praying for your son, why don't you pray with him? Instead of praying for someone else to be reconciled with, why don't you take that step of faith and seek to be reconciled? You and I have put already caps on what God can and cannot do. And God this morning is inviting you to say, don't settle for 20 cherry, cherry tomatoes when I want to fill your refrigerator and then some. Recently, I had a never in my ministry. I would see this young couple coming to church, Nubia and Billy. Uh, he was a professional bodybuilder. You, you couldn't miss him in, in the church because he took like two spaces in the pew. He's a broad little guy. Um, and his uh, wife, uh, girlfriend, Nubia, who you would never guess that she was a grandma. She had had her children young, and now she had a grandkid. And I would see them in church once a week, then three weeks they would not be there, and a month. And one day she approached me, Nubia approaches me and said, Pastor, um, we would like to have my, my daughter would like to have my grandchild dedicated in church. We were wondering if you would be willing to do that for us. And it has to be also an anointing service. Could we do both? My granddaughter... She's eight months, and she has these very aggressive tumors that are jeopardizing her life. We're about to take her to St. Jude for a very invasive procedure. And we want God's blessing on her. We want to dedicate her to the Lord. So we had the whole family in church. 
And when I told the story to my church leaders, it just, there's something about a helpless baby being hurt that just... So the day that Anai was brought to church, this tiny little precious baby that already had markings of procedures and tests that had been done to her. The parents, young couple, he was a police officer in Detroit, were kneeling, and I invited the elders and the deacons and anyone else that wanted to come forward, and I think over half the church came forward. We were so emotionally invested in this little baby. We were all praying, and we were getting updates from Nubia. She was sending them to me, and I was texting them to the church leaders, pass it on. Uh, there are, the procedure's about to start on an IE, and our church was praying and praying, and God, you have to preserve this baby. The procedure was done, and they removed every tumor from Anae's mind and from her brain. It was a totally successful procedure. What no one knew, though, was that there were some preliminary tests that St. Jude does for, tests, for procedures like this, and one of them is a genetic test. It told the parents and the family, these tumors were not random. Her body produces these. A month later, Anai had more tumors in her brain than she had originally had. And a month before her year birthday, she died. <laughs> and I went from dedicating her to the Lord to holding her funeral. And at the other funeral, the church was packed. And I was struggling. God, we, we pray for that little one. How can you let her die? What will the family think now? I was hoping that this would encourage them to come forward, but they heard us pray to you. They, they heard us, and everybody said amen, and we, we spoke in faith that you would heal Anai. And she's dead, Lord. Who will want to know about you now? The funeral ended, and I'm struggling. And Nubia and Billy walk up to me and say, Pastor, we want to start Bible studies with you. The death of my granddaughter has awakened to my lukewarm spirituality. God is not in my life. On a resurrection morning, I don't want my granddaughter to look for me in vain. I'm not right with God. And Billy said the same thing. I hardly know anything about God, and I've been so career-driven, and I'm starting to experience success, but I realized that it's for nothing. It's for nothing. God not in my life. I can't live like this anymore. Nubia's sister, another friend, the niece and the nephews, that a week later, I was studying in their home with a full house in their living room. I thought I'd never want to see this family in church again. God can work through the pain that we experience on this planet and make it for good. You serve a God that is bigger than you think he is right now. And whatever your never it is right now, God wants to face it head on. He wants to reveal to you that he is exactly what the word of God says. That he is abundantly exceedingly, above all, capable of doing beyond what you can ask or think or imagine. And that can translate into much fruit into your life. Is there someone this morning that wants to say, Father, I want to surrender my nerves to you. I want to see you do in me what I am failing to do for myself. This sermon is not about you. You've got to try harder that you're not good enough. This sermon is about you serving a God that is faithful and more than capable of saving you and saving your family. He wants to save your kid more than you want to see that kid saved. The seed in you will produce much fruit. And each one of those fruits has seed in it. Joseph was not kept alive just so that Joseph could live. Joseph was blown away by the reality. God didn't just preserve me. He has preserved my family. And he's not just giving me food for me and my brother, 
more than food, God has given me my family back. God has given me my brothers back. Sin will try to take you from your church, from your brothers and your sisters, and Jesus wants to return that back to you. It hurts him when he sees his church broken and fragmented because of what Satan does. He's inviting you to let him heal your nevers to show you he can calm your storm. Lord, I'm still growing and I'm still blown away by who you are. That experience with Anai, Father, shows me that again and again you're bigger, bigger, and more than capable to do abundantly above whatever I could even dare to ask from you. I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, that like me, we put caps on you. We are sure there are things you will not do, so we don't ask. Precious Lord, I, I pray for the, the family members that are represented by people here this morning in this sanctuary. If there's someone's wife that is far away from you right now, and it seems like they'll never come back, this sermon was for that person to know that you can, that you are able. If there's someone here this morning who is seeing their little one become an adult and gradually drift into the world and they think they'll never come back. Father, I pray that they would have heard your word telling them and assuring them, you can. You are more than powerful to save anybody. You can bring people back into the church. And most importantly, Lord, if there are families that are broken, if there are marriages that are crumbling, and they are hopeless. And they're saying words like Jacob, this will never be what should have been. This, there is no hope in this anymore. That they will have heard your word telling them you're offering them much fruit. An experience that goes far above what they've been praying for. Heal us, Lord. Heal our hearts and make us into trees that produce fruit of righteousness for your honor, your glory, and your praise. In Jesus' name, amen, Lord. Amen.